This is Lawfare, Repression and Canadian Extractivism in Peru, a dialogue with Pedro Castillo's lawyer. Um, we're just going to get started in, uh, in a few seconds. Um, so my name is Bianca Mujeni, and I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which is one of the organizers of uh, today's event, uh, alongside the Quebec Peru Solidarity Collective. Um, I'm speaking to you from Montreal, or Jojage, which is uh, on the territory of the Ganeyangehaga people. So for today's event, um, we're first going to hear from uh, Lucia, and then we're going to hear from Guido, and uh, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience uh, for a little bit of a Q and A. Um, if there are any journalists that are here, please do identify yourself uh, in the chat, and uh, and we'll turn uh, we'll turn your your volume on so that you can ask your question. Um, so we are live to both Zoom and Facebook, and for anyone that wants to share uh, this broadcast, um, the link is facebook.com/slash Canada Policy. Uh, at the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute's uh, Facebook group. Um, so like I said, the chat's open. Hello, hi. Thanks to those of you who are uh, who are saying hi. Hello, Evelyn. Hi, Tina. Wawa. Uh, Robert, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so for today's event, um, just a bit of background. About six months ago in December, uh, Peru elected President um, uh, Sorry, about six months ago, um, there was a big uprising. Um, and this was after Peru elected President uh, Pedro Castillo, um, who was then ousted. At the Organization of American States, the Canadian government immediately backed Castillo's ouster. Um, and amidst large protests and security forces killing over 50 um, of Canada's, uh, uh, killing over 50, Canada's ambassador to Peru, Louis Marcotte, worked hard to shore up support for Dina Boluarte's replacement uh, usurper government. Um, in the six weeks after Castillo was ousted, Marcotte met with Boluarte, as well as Peru's foreign minister, um, vulnerable populations minister, and mining minister. Um, so contrasting Ottawa's reaction um, to the, the right-wing Ecuadorian president, Guillermo Lasso, uh, who dissolved the National Assembly last month, with how they responded to Castillo really further demonstrates the politicized nature of, uh, of Canadian policy. Um, so unlike their criticism of Castillo, Ottawa has stayed quiet uh, when Lasso dissolved Congress, effectively uh, supporting the measure. So um, without further ado, um, we're going to uh, hear from our first panelist, uh, Lucia. Lucia Flores Echais. Lucia is the spokesperson of the Quebec Peru Solidarity Collective. She's a criminal defense attorney and a human rights activist. She's completing a master's degree in law and society at the Université de Quebec à Montréal, UCAM. Welcome, Lucia. Hi, thank you, Bianca. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by introducing a bit the collective uh, I, uh, I'm from. So the Solidarity Quebec, Peru, uh, sorry, Quebec Peru Solidarity Collective, uh, Collectif uh, Solidarité Quebec Peru. So we are a grassroots organization that uh, started organizing at the beginning of the year uh, with the objective of defending human rights in Peru. We were appalled by uh, the massacres, the killings, the repression, basically the lack, uh, the complete lack of respect of, for human rights. And we had to organize ourselves. Sorry, I really have uh, bad allergies today. <laughs> um, so we made several rallies in Montreal, demonstrations, and, uh, petitions, and in general, sensibilization uh, regarding the social and political crisis. Uh, our vision in the collective is not just focused on the political and civil rights that are being violated right now, uh, like freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of opinion, but also the social and economical rights that are more, uh, uh, that are, represent more of the roots of the problem in a way. So the right to water, the right to food, right to health, education, social security, and also well, the rights of indigenous people, um, such as uh, having uh, you know, the rights to their lands, territories, and resources that they're own and occupy. Uh, because um, the protests uh, mainly are being carried, are being mainly carried by indigenous and campesino people uh, of Peru. And uh, uh, so since January, we've tried by several methods to push Canada to denounce the human rights violations and the this uh, regime that took place uh, 
in the December 7, 2022. But sadly, but maybe not surprising for many of us, Canada has uh, refused to denounce the Boluarte regime. Instead, Canada has been an important ally of this repressive regime. Um, indeed, so since the beginning, so when Castillo uh, was, uh, there was a vacancy of Castillo that uh, Guido will probably explain later why it was not constitutional. Um, the Canada has offered the support for this regime, even though um, uh, many people in the, the country, actually there was a, a uh, inquesta, how do you say, sondage, sorry, uh, a survey, a national survey that shows that most people in Peru believe that there was a coup against Pedro Castillo. So a poll, thank you. <laughs> there was a, a national poll that showed that actually most people think that it was uh, Pedro Castillo that suffered a coup by the right wing. So not, uh, it was not Pedro Castillo that did. A lot of people, and that's the, the, the state's official view right now that it was Pedro Castillo that did the, the, the coup, but that is not what most people in the streets and most people in general believe. Uh, so um, yes, so Ambassador Mar Market uh, has, uh, that it's ambassador of Canada in Peru, has met and showed his support for uh, Boluarte and also, uh, for example, uh, an interest, particular interest in uh, energy and, and mines. He has met several times with Peruvian Minister of Energy and Mines and um, has, since the beginning of the crisis, uh, showed a lot of support and a lot of uh, interest in the mining sector in Peru. There's a lot of meetings since the beginning of the crisis. And um, there was uh, also this um, uh, PDAC, Congress, that it's the Prospectors and Developers Associations of Canada, which is an annual conference very important regarding the mining sector. And there was an important Peruvian delegation in this um, conference that happened in, uh, in Toronto. We, uh, as in our collective, we made a statement uh, against this uh, uh, conference and against the complicity of Canada um, by, instead of denouncing they're they're receiving and congratulating uh, the um, Otarola, the minister Otarola. Um, there's there was minister, Canadian minister, that hand in hand with the minister Otarola, who uh, actually on January 9, the day of the massacre in Peru, in Peru, where 18 civilians were killed, including five young people under 19 years of age, Mr. Otarola explained that what happened instead that day was an attack by some vandals and violent organizations against the rule of law. So this defamation, this information and dehumanization of the victims has perpetrated and normalized a situation of unacceptable injustice. So in addition, on January 25, for example, Otorala announced an additional economic bonus to the heroic and glorious national police, which professionally maintains internal order. So. We are seeing so and so and um, uh, since the beginning of the year, there has been a lot of reports. For example, Amnesty International, the Com um, Commission Inter uh, Inter Inter American um, Human Rights Commission uh, that has made a report, all uh, saying that there were uh, ex extrajudicial executions from the uh, national security forces towards the population and mainly indigenous and campesino. And uh, why does Canada uh, is supporting this uh, regime? We, uh, well, we know that Canada has economic interests in the region. And we can see that this, the Castillo was not favorable in a way to Canadian uh, mining interest and that the new regime is. Um, Lastly, I'd like just to, to point out that um, the Amnesty International has done a report re regarding the sale of weapons that Canada has done uh, in, the, in the past years to Peru, weapons to the security forces, uh, Peruvian security forces, 
And in the last years, so this type of weapons, what Canada does is, uh, yes, they say that they do a due diligence, you know, um, but after they sell the weapons, they lose track of them. They don't know, and for them, it's not their responsibility. So they do uh, due diligence for like before selling them, and then they they sell them. And so, and this type of weapons that were sold are like the same type of weapons that were that you were used to kill indigenous and campesino people are the same type of weapons that were sold. So we don't, we cannot know for sure because there's no tracking system if those are the same, but still it is very worrisome. And Brazil, Spain have, after popular um, mobilization, uh, they have announced that they will stop selling uh, our weapons to Peru. And Amnesty International is asking that, and we are also asking that for, to Canada to stop the weapon sale to this regime that uh, has done, he is continuing to do an, like uh, extra uh, judicial executions and many human rights violations. And Canada so far is, uh, is silent and actually not silent, is complicit. Um, so for us, that is, um, we would like to, to, uh, to continue this fight in denouncing Canada's role in the, uh, the crisis right now, and especially because in July, protests are uh, going to um, uh, regain momentum. There's a, a, a big protest plan for July. So, and the Peruvian state response is still very, uh, for example, two, year, two days ago, Dina Boluarte mentioned, why do you want like, why do you want to protest? Like, what do you want more? How many more deaths do you want? Which is, in a way, a very, it's 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 a threat in a way that I think because they denounce that they have any responsibility in the deaths because for them it's just uh, criminals and they are just the law and order doing their jobs, which is very scary for uh, the next weeks to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lucia. Thank you for that really critical, uh, important background information, um, and in particular, Canada's role and interests in the region, um, as well as the demands that you put forward around uh, stopping weapons sales uh, and ending the complicity. Um, so please do find out more about the uh, Quebec-Peru Solidarity Collective, especially if you are um, in Quebec, and uh, looking very forward to hearing more from you, uh, Lucia, in the Q&A. Um, so we're now joined by um, Guido Leonardo Croxada. Croxado. Uh, Guido is a human rights lawyer who currently directs the Latin America Institute of Criminology and Social Development based in Lima, Peru. He directed the International Court on Human Rights and Academic Mediation by UNLA and is um, Professor of Special Problems of Access to Justice and Sociology of Law at the National University of Lanús. Thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule. Welcome, Guido. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Lucia. Gracias a los que están escuchando. I was teaching a class, as you say before, at the Human Rights Institution here in, at the University of Lanús in Buenos Aires. Uh, sorry for the informality. Uh, sitting, I am sitting with Micaela, who is going to help me when I have to translate something into English, because I am used to speaking German, but not in English. I wrote uh, some lines about the crisis in Peru. Uh, I think the most important uh, is the discussion about the not respect to the due process in the destitution of President Pedro Castillo. I am his lawyer now at the American system. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I agree with Clark Joseph. Um, Lucia spoke about the declarations of Boluarte. I think the, in Europe or in Canada, uh, it would be impossible to hear something, not from a president, but from a professor or a deputy or uh, anyone who is uh, involved in politics or in human rights. Uh, I think uh, she say yesterday, cuantos muertos más necesitan or something like that. In English, uh, how many 
deaths or how how many more deaths do you need to stop a protest against this regime so uh, from the constitutional perspective uh, this is against freedom of speech uh, that is uh, a basis abc in human rights uh, doctrine that is why we agree, the human rights lawyers, that what is happening now in Peru is against democracy. Uh, I think too many countries uh, have sometimes uh, a double stand. They show outside the discourse of human rights, peace, democracy, progress on one side, but under the table, as Lucia said before, they export, for example, Germany to weapons that are used to kill people. And it is not uh, funny for me to know, I, I didn't know that, that Canada is in this case, in the Peru case, uh, not an exception. For example, Spain, I think, and Brazil too, they stop selling weapons to Peru, the bo both. But I understand, as I said, that Canada is not doing the same. Perhaps the first thing that should be done is to fight uh, against misinformation. It is really a herald for them. This is a German word. The, I, I need some time because I, I have in my head all the words in German. So I have to translate from German into English before I talk. Uh, it is a challenge because in Canada or in Germany, where I used to live, the media is concentrated, but not concentrated as in Peru or in Argentina, as in Argentina. We have the same problem. It is difficult. The basis is difficult in Latin America. It is difficult to have free information. Yes, as Julia said, the misinformation is a big problem in Peru, but also in Brazil, in Argentina, Mexico. And I think uh, other countries uh, like Canada or Germany, France, well, France is an exception, but they benefit from this misinformation. They don't help people to give a bigger discussion. That is why this event that Bianca and Lucia are leading are important because we need to fight against misinformation and uh, demand, for example, the government in Canada to take concrete measures to protect human rights in Peru. Uh, maybe Lucia spoke about that. The latest report from Amnesty International was very clear in, in Peru. Uh, they talked about lethal racism and people who are murdered are uh, poor people or indigenous people from the south of the land of Peru, Cusco, Juliaca, Arequipa. But that is not always reported. Uh, as I said, in Peru, most of the media are highly concentrated, and Argentina is the same. We have the same problem here in Argentina. Not everyone uh, has uh, the same freedom to express themselves. Freedom of speech is for very few. And that is why it is very dangerous when the president in this context uh, challenged the people not to express themselves. This uh, direct against democracy. That is one conclusion I reached in Italy a month ago, uh, that part of our work as human rights lawyers is this, is to break this uh, wall of silence uh, that exists regarding these crimes in Peru, in El Salvador too. And we expect from countries like Canada or Denmark, Denmark use it to support the inter-American system. Uh, this commitment to the human rights culture, to the freedom of speech, to be coherent and consistent. When we talk about human rights and then we export weapons to Peru, there is an incoherence. And when we look who is going on or what is behind these double standards, a man can, we can find, sorry, that was German, we can find a, a negotiation. 
Business, yes, business. For me, it's very funny uh, uh, when I see in the faculties of law around the world, this business and human rights topic. I, I am not, I don't understand what, uh, what they, uh, the, the point is really, uh, we have to expect that the big concerns involving human rights. Our experience in Latin America is uh, that all the business are uh, uh, at the end against human rights development and against the rule of law, against democracy, against uh, indigenous people, against rights. That is why this wall of silence, this media that are concentrated, they work with the big uh, say, empresas, companies uh, around the world, they benefit from this uh, uh, news. The Supreme Court in Peru has just declared, but two weeks ago, I think, that protesting uh, is a crime now in Peru. Uh, in other words, uh, freedom of expression is not respected either. It's not longer a right in Peru now. Uh, there is a song, maybe you have heard this song is circulating on the network that repeats that there is no, that this democracy is no longer a democracy, democracy is not a democracy. And I always make the same comparison. In France, a week, you know, a month ago, there were demonstrations against Macron's pension reform, and there were, so far I know, no deaths. In Peru, peaceful demonstrations had already 70 deaths. And the question for me is maybe life in Peru worth less than life in France, because I don't see any with the exceptions of Lopez Obrador from Mexico and Gustavo Petro from Colombia, maybe Xiomara Castro from Honduras also, the other leaders of Latin America, not only in Europe or in Canada, uh, they are not speaking about these people who were murdered in Peru. And I think uh, that is unacceptable. Uh, regarding my role as Castillo's lawyer, I think, as I say, the first thing to say, the removal from Castillo was inconstitutional. Uh, because the president was removed from the charge in violation of due process. That is why the dismissal is illegal, I would say. The constitutional procedures to remove a president uh, were not respect in the case of Pedro Castillo. And that is the same point. Castillo represent the poor people from Peru, from the south of Peru, the indigenous people. Uh, and that is the reason why, and not a discourse in the Congress or in the media, uh, that was the reason from the removal from the power in Peru. Protests, as I say, were brutally repressed, as you may know. More, uh, not only the people who was killed, uh, people who were uh, injured during the, pro the protests against Boluarte, they didn't want to go to the hospitals because they have angst, angst, sorry, that is Sherman. They were afraid uh, to be criminalized, criminalized in the hospitals. They are also persecuted there. Some people from Peru asked me if I could write a letter to the Cruz Roja, to Amnesty International too, to help these people who is ill now in Peru, but they don't want to receive medical help because they, they are afraid from the criminalization. Uh, maybe if I will say that in Spanish, I am going to say it in English, but uh, due process is important in a democracy. We can like Castillo or not, but that is not the most important question from the human rights perspective. There are constitutional procedures to remove a president in Canada, in Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina too, which in this case were not respected. 
from my point of view, this is the only uh, most important thing. The procedure in Canada and Argentina has rules, forms, steps that must be followed and they were not respected uh, in this case. That is the reason why we think uh, with Safaroni, who is lawyer from Castillo with me too, that the removal from Castillo is uh, inconstitutional and illegal. The criminalization, as I said, of protests can reach, uh, as I said before, a judicial measure in Peru. And when we make a comparison between Peru and Europa or Peru and Canada, I think this is unthinkable in Europe. But in Peru, it's happening now. And civil rights are violated every day. Uh, opponents are persecuted, dissident is persecuted. Uh, all the people is criminalized. Uh, students from the University of San Marcos, where I was once, are criminalized also. Uh, there are some books in Peru that they are private. One can, uh, you cannot choose your own lectures. Uh, Judges can evaluate what is in the programs at the university. There are still prohibited uh, readings in Peru. Uh, there is against the academic freedom and academic uh, freedom of, of expression. The protest is censored. Amnesty was censored when it was going to present its human rights report at the Casa de la Memoria, the LUM two months ago, uh, and I don't hear uh, no one talking about this act of cen censorship, no? Against censorship, censorship against Amnesty International. Nobody can say that Amnesty uh, has a political commitment in Peru. This is an NGO uh, with my focus on human rights, and they were censored also. But uh, I think it is true the racism is a problem in Peru now, but it is not just a question of human rights or racism, what is going on in Peru. It is more uh, than that, I would say. It is that a democratically elected president who represent those sectors, racial and allies, uh, was dismissed. Uh, so, I think as conclusion, this aspect cannot be ignored or separated to the two issues. Sometimes uh, when we speak about the criminalization of the people who was murdered by the police in Peru, uh, some journalists said, okay, we are, we are agree with you, but there are two different problems. On one side, the destitution of Castillo, on the other side, the people who were murdered. But I think that is a, mistake this perspective because are the same phenomenon. Uh, the process against Castillo was inconstitutional, was against the rule of the Congress and against the constitution of Peru. And then the people who was uh, offended, uh, they go to the street to protest against this uh, destitution because they know what has happened with Castillo was the same that always happened with the poor people in Peru. Uh, they have no civil rights, not political rights. Castillo cannot, from the Penal de Barbadillo, speak with his uh, son, who is in exile in Mexico now. And that is against the rights of the child, so not only the rights of Castillo, who is incommunicate, so, uh, but also the rights of the uh, children uh, in exile in Mexico. I think uh, the death and the dismissal respond to the same fact, and racism is what uh, lead to this uh, situation. Castillo, as Lucia said before, was not going, was not being allowed to govern. Yes, it is, was the same in Bolivia. Uh, the same in Honduras, uh, Bolivia, Evo Morales, uh, exactly. Correa also, Rafael Correa, he's in exile. Uh, 
eh, in Belgium, in Belgica, eh, Lula also he was one year in prison, and that's the reason why Bolsonaro won the election. And then the judge Moro, who jailed uh, Lula, then was the Minister of Justice of Brazil during the government of Bolsonaro at the beginning. And that is against the independence of the justice. Uh, and that is what we call lawfare in Latin America. There are different chapters of this uh, lawfare film. And now we are talking about the Peru chapter of this lawfare uh, film. But we have a chapter in Bolivia, we had a chapter in Ecuador, we had a chapter in Honduras, we had a chapter in Argentina, we had a chapter in Brazil with Lula. And maybe we are going to have new chapters in other lands in the future. I hope not, but when, when if you are realist, uh, I think what is going on in, Col in Colombian it is uh, in the same way. From the first day, uh, Castillo was discriminated. That was, that is what he said to me in prison. And that is why he was dismissed for what he uh, represents. Uh, in fact, so the, the poorest people in Peru. I hope we can, in the trials, change this situation because I hope uh, justice can be done. But at the end, there is not only a discussion about due process, uh, but this political discussion that involve also the resources of Peru and the interest of other lands, the resources of Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, or Argentina. That, because that's the, it's not only a political discussion, but the economic discussion uh, also. Thank you for the patience. And if you have a question, I can intend to respond that in English. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Guido, for um, for your intervention. Um, really important to be enlightened as to what is happening on the ground. And thank you for your important analysis and your work as well uh, with President Castillo. It's uh, it's important to understand these details. Um, the repression and the role of, of lawfare. And I look forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. Um, next, we'll hear a brief word from uh, Ernesto Romer, um, who is from the Toronto-based group Sedepeca Peruanos Canadienses. Uh, welcome, Ernesto. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Thank you very much, Blanca, for your invitation. And thank you, thank you very, very much to the lawyer that uh, described perfectly what's going on in Peru. It's just amazing how people from other countries can see easily what's going on in our country. Uh, we, the organization uh, Democratic Center, Peruvian Democratic Center in Toronto, we organize ourselves after the uh, problems in Peru start to happen with Castillo. We belong to different uh, ideological tendencies, doesn't matter. In this moment, our purpose is to defend the democracy in Peru, whatever it takes. So we are getting uh, together, uh, we create uh, different activities in order to get some funds and send to Peru constantly for people who are hurt by the police, the militars, people who are hungry because they, they are displaced, people who are in the jail that have no lawyers um many other things so now we are preparing something for the next uh big uh groups that they are uh organizing in lima for probably the july 16 july 20 something like that so uh thank you uh, as well for all your ideas to, to us, we are very clear that it's a geopolitical situation, very complicated, very extremely complicated. Um, people believe that we have democracy. We don't have democracy. We never have, ever have democracy. But we, we are used to this situation. We believe that this is a democracy. Where groups of interest, big corporations, largest corporation in the world control countries like Peru, 
Argentina, many others. So uh, my, my uh, belief is that we have the help with lawyers like Rosato and other people with that statue, uh, we can get, go ahead in this lo long way to, to restitute uh, Castillo first, that's the first step, and secondly, to reorganize the country in a, in a way that people benefit from the real democracy. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us. Um, and thanks again to all of our panelists. For people who are interested in the work um, of Ernesto's group, please do uh, find out more about um, the organization. Uh, Ernesto, if it's possible to uh, put a link to uh, Sedepeca Peruanos Canadienses in the chat so people can go and find out about the work that you're doing and, and, uh, and support you, that would be great. So we're now uh, heading into the Q&A uh, portion of our uh, evening. Um, we don't have too much time, but we do have quite a few questions, which is wonderful. Thank you to all of the audience members who have uh, submitted them. We also got a few in advance. I'm gonna get right to them um, just so that we can use the time that we have. So we have a question from uh, Wawa, who wants to know, um, what would you say to people making parallels of what Al Alberto Fujimori did? Um, and I guess I'll start with uh, Guido and then Lucia, if you want to uh, join in as well. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for your patience, because for me it's difficult to speak in English now, because as I said before, I always think in German, so I have to translate from German to English. Uh, this is complex in my head. That's the, the reason for the delay, not the internet connection, but my uh, German language in my head. Uh, I think it is quite amazing that in the same creation uh, is Fushimori and Castillo, because uh, they are uh, quite opposite and the two extremes of the political situation in Peru. But for me, it's not Schlima, sorry, that is a German word. Schlima, what is it? Mas grave todavía. More strange or difficult to understand for me that the congressist uh, who voted against Castillo, thank you, Elizabeth. I, I know it is not true, but thank you also. Uh, Alejandro Aguinaga was minister from the Fujimori uh, dictatorship. He was, he is responsible of the esterilization of thousands of women, indigenous women of Peru, a poor indigenous women of Peru. Uh, this organization, AMPAEF, they fly from Peru to Argentina during the Human Rights Week in Buenos Aires in March. And we have a meeting and they came to my office in Argentina and they asked me for helping them. And for me, it was quite amazing to here, these indigenous women, they are still fighting in Peru to find justice. They don't have any response. Uh, and they told me uh, from this case, and that is was that for me is unacceptable. This Alejandro Aguinaga congressist, he voted against Castillo because Castillo has not a moral capacity. But Aguinaga, who was uh, responsible as a health minister, during the Fujimori dictatorship from the esterilization from thousands of women, which is a crime against humanity. When you read the Roma uh, statute, the article seven or eight, the sterilization of, of a group of persons that can uh, be criminalized as a, a, a crime uh, against humanity, but he's not in prison. His Congress is now, Today in Peru, he's sitting in the Congress and he is one of the Congresses who voted against Castillo, who did nothing but reading a, a paper. We, when we study law, we think the, how do you say, equal, equal equity uh, against the law, from in front of the law. In Peru, it's exactly the opposite. If you are poor, if you come from the South, if you're a woman, if you are uh, indigenous, you have no civil rights and you have to be afraid to speak. 
what I saw in Peru four weeks ago is that the people, students of the University of San Marcos, human rights lawyers, friends, friends of mine, they are all they have a, they are afraid, afraid for losing his job, for his family. They're afraid. There is too much. Hay mucho miedo. Is, there is, man can see a lot of fear in Peru, civil organizations, human rights. If the government can censor Amnesty International, they can do anything without consequences. That's the reason why Lucia uh, quoted Boluarte. He told yesterday in the TV news in Spanish, how, how much more, how many, what more of us? How more many deaths do you need to stop protesting against the regime? I think that is no longer a democracy or this uh, in Peru. And the Fujimori experience in the judicial uh, Ebene, Ebene is a German word, sorry, what is it in the campo? Uh, in the, no, in the judicial field, the Fujimori history is still alive. They are not, the, the judges, they not operate with a modern parliament with human rights culture or perspective or gender perspective or indigenous perspective. They apply or they still apply this uh, Montesinos and Fujimori's perspective against the people who are treated not as civil citizens who are protesting, but as enemies. They have to be killed. Thank you, Guido. Lucia, do you have any, uh, anything to add to that? Uh, well, yes. Uh... Some people are making parallels, of course, I mean, the right wing in Peru, because of some words, you know, that were used to, when Fujimori did a, um, like dissolve Congress, um, the parliament in the 1992, and some words that were mentioned, you know, of the Southern Congress by Castillo. But I mean, the difference, and Guido has uh, pointed out quite uh, well, is because it's not, Fujimori, what he did, and the reason why we consider it a coup is because there were military, they had military in his side. He had the economical power. He he corrupted the media. So I think when we can see like who has the control of the military, what is the military, the media, the economic interest, and the North American uh, interest, and and then, then we can see the coup. And uh, and Castillo uh, didn't have any of that. Since the beginning of, I mean, since before it was elected, there was a lot of racist misinformation against him, and uh, and there's been like there was a, the third time they were trying to vacate him. So I think those factors um, are, are those parameters are much more um, relevant than uh, just like uh, words of uh, uh, dissolving uh, the parliament, which is actually a measure that. Uh, you know, criticizable, but many presidents around the world have done it, and it's not that criticizable. For example, um, we can, of course, in Ecuador, uh, that measure was applied, and and uh, um, Canada, U.S. have not denounced it. You know, they they agree with it. Uh, Ukraine's president uh, did that too, and uh, in general, Canada and U.S. are uh, big allies of this president. So it's really um, uh, a really different treatment. To Castillo because he was going in a way uh, against the economic interests of uh, of U.S. and Canada. Thank you, Lucia. Um, so we have a couple of questions around lawfare. Um, one was submitted in advance, which is just very basic. What exactly is lawfare? Like, if you were to give a definition, what is lawfare? We can start with you, Guido. Well, uh, instrumentalizing the judiciary system, I would say, with political intentions to defeat a leader when you cannot defeat this leader in the democratic, democratic field. And then with this point of view, you can understand what happened with Lula in Brazil, with Rafael Correa in Ecuador. I was with Correa a, a week, you know, a month ago, we make an interview here in Argentina. Uh, we speak about uh, the coup in Peru, but the, as Lucia said before, the comparison between Ecuador at the same, with the same situation as in Peru, but Guillermo Lasso uh, 
had the support from the banks of Ecuador, and Pedro Castillo had no support, or the, all the support of the people who is poor, not from the banks uh, in Peru. But the same Evo Morales, who was in exile in Argentina, Zafaroni was lawyer from Evo Morales too. Uh, Lugo in Paraguay, uh, in Argentina also, uh, and Celaya uh, in Honduras. Uh, the people in Honduras voted uh, recently, Xiomara Castro. Xiomara Castro is the, as we say, the esposa, the, the wife from Manuel Celaya. Manuel Celaya in 2009 was the first of these new forms of ¿cómo se dice? golpe de Estado, the coup against uh, popular leaders. It was the beginning of this lawfare history in Latin America, the fall from Honduras, from Celaya. But I hope that the people understand the situation. And in Honduras, Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina, uh, and I hope soon in uh, Ecuador and Peru also, they understand. It is, it is the same if they understand a due process, constitutional law, that is the same, but they understand when something is not transparent, this kind of injustice against these leaders, popular leaders. And that's the reason why these countries are voting the persons again. In Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina, Ecuador, Mexico, Colombia, Honduras also. Uh, but I think Lofer at the end is a threat to democracy. Thank you. Um, so we have a question um, uh, also a, a le in legal realm. Percy wants to know, is there any legal avenue to free Castillo and uh, restore constitutional order? Uh, Lucia, do you want to start or Guido? Uh, I think I will I'll leave this one uh, to, to Guido, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, of course. But uh, you, when when a person asks this question, there is a who is a presupuesto? Mm -hmm. uh, a budget. Or, uh, well, uh, in Spanish, the word uh, is presupuesto. Uh, ah, Guatemala too, of course. Uh, and people from Salvador. What is amazing for me is people from uh, different lands uh, send me emails to help them because they find lawfare in Salvador, lawfare, I, I have no time. I am, I am working alone and that is quite too big. We are working with Safaroni, but it seems to me that it's a phenomenon uh, that political parties, uh, progressist parties and leaders and movements in Latin America have to work coordinated uh, and they have to reach a consensus to fight against uh, this uh, phenomenon that we call lawfare. In the Castillo case, I will say yes, but that depends on how the judges in Peru respect the law. And this is not the case. That is our problem. Yes, as Cor said, for example, if you read the Constitution in Peru, the Congress law too, you can see two or three articles that were not respected in the removal from Castillo. That is why I always say in Spanish, uh, it is the same. Even if you think that Castillo has to be removed, the problem is that the process, that the Congress instrumentalized was inconstitutional. That is the key problem. And why they do that? Because they knew that what they were doing was against the law. And they have no much time. That's the reason they they work it too because they're schnell. That is Deutsch, too fast. Uh, but the people understand this corruption from the system, and they, uh, they went to the streets to protest. But the repression was brutal, and the people in Peru now, even judges and lawyers, they are afraid. They're afraid. That is the reason why I'm from Argentina speaking about Castillo. I know too many lawyers, uh, academic lawyers, they support us and our work, 
but they are uh, afraid to appear talking about this. We have no fear, but uh, it is a risk in Honduras, in El Salvador, in Guatemala, in Peru today, in some regions of Brazil too, to speak about some issues. For example, the uh, environmental law, uh, resources, uh, and human rights also. In Guatemala, Honduras, it's a risk. It's not a einfach. It's, it's not a easy, sorry, to work in these fields because, as Lucia said before, there are big, invisible interests behind these discussions. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Julio who wants to know, is there any direct involvement or support by the Canadian Embassy, specifically Louis uh, Marcotte, that may not have been reported by the media, apart from meetings that they have with Canadian mining representatives that uh, Canadians should be aware of? Um, is there any presence of uh, Canadian legal advisors? Um, Lucia, do you have any uh, insight to this? Uh, Guido, either of you. Lucia, yeah. I think Lucia yeah. actually no, not that I know of. I mean, it's very hard to have a, a like unofficial information. The, the information we know mainly is from the uh, uh, Luis Marco, uh, like Twitter account, social media, or like the official Kennedy embassy, or, and that we can see the meetings. Um, and uh, if not, it, it's hard to say uh, if there were uh, discussions before uh, the 7th of December. I know that regarding the ambassador of the U.S. that uh, there was a meeting uh, before and which has led a lot of people uh, to wonder what was discussed in that meeting and was it... But it is really hard to to because we don't have the you know the the proof we have the different pieces of a puzzle but uh, uh, there, we cannot uh, know for sure uh, what has been uh, going on behind the uh, behind doors you know <laughs> it's a hard question it's it's like asking do you know about any secret meetings well. <laughs> Um, so the next questions, we have a few questions about extractivism. We're coming very close to the end of our time. We're going to stop at the top of the hour. Um, we have two questions about extraction. Um, uh, one submitted in advance. What is the role of extractivism in this crisis? Uh, and also Kathleen wants to know what Canadian mining companies uh, are in Peru. Um, uh, maybe Lucia, I'll start with you and, uh, and then Guido. Um, well, you... uh, I can name uh, some of them. Uh, just uh, for example, there's a uh, Hood Bay Minerals. Uh, that's a Toronto uh, mining company that uh, operates the Constancia mine. Uh, Pan American Silver, uh, Vancouver based, uh, operates the Shawindo and La, La Arena mines. And there, there's also Tech Resources that are headquarters in Vancouver that operates the Antamina mine. Uh, with uh, and Antabina, it's actually a Peru, uh, one of either the uh, Peru largest mine or one of them. And it's among the 10 producing mines in the world in terms of volume. Uh, most important producer of copper, silver, zinc. Uh, and uh, there's also a lot of lithium uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, mining companies. And also uh, something that is important to say that a lot of these companies are based in Canada, but the uh, that is uh, the hot corners and the legal uh, incorporation is in Canada, but the interests can be uh, from abroad. Uh, so sometimes the interests are not necessarily from Canadians themselves. Uh, and yes, uh, it has played a, a big role, actually, the, the term American uh, American Human Rights Commission in the report talks about how extractivism have played a role. Uh, indigenous and campesino people are uh, are have had enough of uh, uh, centuries of exploitation and of uh, despojo. How do you say uh, in English? I mean, of uh, uh, having uh, been stripped of their resources and uh, and. So they wanted to do, to to stop. Uh, they uh, the figure of Castillo represented for them a democratic way of having more power in their territories, having more uh, auto determination of their uh, territories, and uh, and that's and I think the reason why they they want to continue the fight because the, the issues are are too big and 
and they're defending lands also. Uh, and so I think from an environmental perspective, if one is uh, cares about uh, climate uh, justice, one should uh, really uh, support the, the, the resistance uh, from the indigenous peoples right now. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, any, any words to add, Guido, on the role of extractivism in the crisis? I think Lucia was assuming perfectly, and I am completely agree. But I think that it's quite obvious. It's yeah. not uh, so simple the destitution of an indigenous president from Cajamarca, who is a rural professor, when at the same time you have people in the Congress uh, who committed crimes against humanity and they are free with no consequences. I think the situation is these people, uh, they work from other interests behind the democratic institutions in Peru. And I think not only from Canada, but the big concerns around the world have interest in the natural resources from Peru. Castillo wanted to nationalize, for example, lithium in Peru. The same uh, measure uh, that Lopez Obrador in Mexico and Boric in Chile uh, take for a, a month or two months ago, but uh, the Congress, can we say, impossibilito, uh, uh, that Castillo couldn't take uh, his uh, program of government, his economic measures. The Congress always stopped them. When he want to massificate, I don't know if the, this word in English exists, the gas provision in Peru, or when he want to make the free ingress at the universities in Peru, like in Argentina, or the, the transform, reformation of the health system in Peru, or the nationalization of some resources that are provided, science in Fushimori, uh, he couldn't they always uh, find the same problem. The Congress was against all his decisions. He told me in prison, the coup d'etat uh, began the first day of my government. That was the first phrase he told me the first time we, uh, I met him in prison because I speak about the end of the process and he corrected me and he told me in Spanish, in Spanish, I am going to tell this in Spanish. No, compañero, el golpe de Estado empezó el primer día de mi gobierno. That was the first thing he told me. Uh, and he was right, of course. I think it is useful for you to read the titles, the names of all the law projects he sent to the Congress with no results before. A recoup against him. I, I think that can give us a more complex understanding of what happens in Peru. Thank you. There's actually quite a few more questions, but we have reached the end of our time. And so I'm just going to ask a concluding question. Uh, what should we expect of Canada? I'm going to start with you, Lucia, and then uh, we'll finish with you, Guido. What should we expect of Canada? Well, um... I think uh, Peru is uh, is is an important is is too much of a big interest for Canada to um, to denounce uh, easily. That's why Canada is so silent, and sometimes when they speak, it's in support. Uh, so we would need a big mobilization in Canada uh, uh, for Canada to uh, denounce. I think it is possible. I think it's possible, uh, for example, regarding the weapons sale to um, with the collective and Amnesty International, we're trying to see what we can do. Um, you know, so there are some ways of maybe a like a petition, a parliament uh, petition that we can present, uh, also uh, more mobilization um, and try uh, and try to to make Canada stop, for example, the weapons sale and denounce. I think if we uh, get mobilized in Canada and other people in other countries, the international pressure can uh, can become uh, at a certain point where uh, 
where the regime is no longer legitimate in the international eyes, which can evidently help with the crisis in Peru. But a lot of factors are, are to be determined. Um, it's uh, it's hard to, to stay mobilized, but it's important. It's a really important fight. Thank you, Lucia. Guido? Uh, I think all you are doing help uh, people in Peru, help the journalists, help the lawyers, help the women, um, help the people who is afraid. Uh, because someone is looking what is going on in Peru, for example, in Denmark or in Canada, and that helps uh, people to defend himself and his own rights. I think uh, international pressure, as Lucia said before, is quite important. Uh, I met some presidents from Mexico, Colombia, uh, and they support us, and that helps. But the most important is to massificate or to fight this wall of silence and this misinformation in Latin America. I think when these events like these that you, Bianca, and Lucia organized are useful to fight uh, this misinformation situation because with information, people, when people find something uh, clear in this way, uh, can uh, find more arguments to defend democracy. I think all we can do to visibilize what is going on in Peru help us. And like Chile in Pinochet or Videla in Argentina, uh, the enemies of the dictatorship was uh, the free press. When we talk about the crimes, uh, these regimes, uh, they stop to kill people, for example, uh, we were in Peru in, uh, with human rights activists from Argentina in March, and then maybe because the people is afraid, but the government is conscious too that around the world they are looking what is going on in Peru. I talked with uh, uh, embass embassies to people from the United Nations system. Inter-American system too, and the government know that. But for example, I am going to only to, uh, to narrate this because this can show you how works the dictatorship in Peru now. Uh, they censor Amnesty International. I gave an interview to a media in Berlin, Berlin Zeitung, and then I gave an interview to El País from Spain. In the both cases. Uh, before, no, uh, the post after, no? Uh, after I gave these interviews, in both cases, in Spain and in Germany, the embassy from Peru, the ambassador, uh, sent a letter to criticize in the both cases. The medias, El País from Spain and uh, Berlin and Saito in, in Germany, uh, only because they uh, have done this interview with me. And this, for me, that is unacceptable. Against freedom of speech, this uh, journalist sent the letters to me that was really funny because they cannot understand what is going on in Peru. How can a government criticize a, a, a media for making an interview? That is uh, amazing. But I am not talking about this to, to talk about me, but to talk about the people in Peru. If they do this to me, and I am the lawyer from Castillo, and they, they censor Amnesty International, what can expect a student from the University of San Marcos? What can expect an indigenous woman from Cajamarca when she wants to protest against Dina Boluarte? That's the reason they, why they are afraid. And I think uh, that's the reason why we need to speak more about the situation in Peru, and that will lead to democracy again in Peru. Thank you. I think that's an excellent note on which to end today. That's all the time we've got. This was an excellent discussion. Um, I just want to conclude by saying, you know, as Canada, we are complicit. We can't just sit back. Um, and it's important to remember the role of international solidarity. And I think we've heard about that today, how important it is, especially within the context of how much repression there is in Peru uh, itself for those who would like to speak out. So please do share this event. It's on Facebook. 
I'm also going to send it out to uh, to all registrants. Um, please let's forward it far and wide um, to help with the education and to fight the misinformation as well. So I just want to thank the panelists um, so much. I want to thank the Quebec uh, Peru Solidarity Collective. Thanks to the audience. Uh, thanks to uh, Lucia Flores Achais and Wawa Lee for their background work as well and organizing. Thanks to Ernesto. Um, who spoke to us about the work that he is doing with his collective. Um, and again, thank you, Guido. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your work and for so generously taking the time out to talk to us and help us understand the situation. Um, so that's it for our event today. And uh, wish you all a good night and, and peace. Bye. Thank, thank you, you, Bianca. Thank you, Lucia. Un abrazo fuerte. Nos vemos. Bye. Thank you, Guido. Bye. Nos vemos.